am I talking about here? I'm talking about Exotica, but I'm also talking about magic. The ability to create new realities by basically faking it until you make it. So, yeah, I, th I feel like that's something that's at stake in all of this. Greetings, future fossils. I am delighted to share this episode with you. This week's guest is Phil Ford, musicologist, pianist, writer, co-host of Weird Studies podcast. Phil has been on the show with J.F. Martell to talk about the weird in episode 126, I think. But it felt necessary to get a one-on-one -on -one with Phil, get J.F. out of the picture. J.F.'s been on the show a lot. Phil Ford wrote this extraordinary paper, Taboo, Time and Belief in Exotica, that my buddy Mitch Mignano and I were mulling over and so this week we're going to take a deep dive into time, space, culture, magic, power, art, hopefully come to a deeper understanding of the prima materia of human existence. I am honored that I get to share this profound and inspiring piece of academic music writing with you check the show notes but first it is the time to share my deep thanks my streaming gratitude and appreciation for joshua yeldon and hillary selden oddly enough who both upped their pledges ryan s who just joined as a patron and everyone else who has been supporting future fossils buying artwork said plainly none of this would happen without your support and i thank you deeply Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you. Let's dive right in. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm okay. How was your Halloween? Oh, it was fine. It was unremarkable. Watched a very silly movie. What'd you watch? This was my wife's idea. I'm going to blame this on my wife. Uh, <laughs> okay. called Enola Holmes with Millie Bobby Brown of Stranger Things fame. Oh, yeah? And uh, just a very silly movie about Sherlock Holmes' little sister out there solving crimes, solving oh, mysteries. Oh, right. Yes. And uh, trying to remember who was it that plays Sherlock in that seemed like yeah. a really fun choice. I don't know who that guy was. Uh, he looked vaguely familiar, but I wasn't really paying attention to things like the casting. Uh, I was high. I'm just going to tell you right now. I was high. <laughs> And just in that mood where I'm like, just entertain me, Netflix, just bring it. Yeah, that's that's what Shit's Creek is for. I found. Uh... Oh, I love that show. Yeah, I watched that um, with my wife a fair bit. It's a very sweet natured show. Yeah, and also the fact that it is two SCTV alums, Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. I am a huge SCTV fan from back in the day. The acme of Canadian humor, and it's and it just pleases me to see on Shit's Creek how many old SCTV beats are back. You know, I totally. My my stepmother grew up in Canada, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I saw them all at like an eight seater back in the eighties." It's just like you know, whenever whenever a Canadian celebrity makes it, you know, it's like the whole country just like pumps the fist. Yes, you know, and also uh, envies that person and tries to pull them down. There's also that. <laughs> the other side right what is it the uh crabs uh, the, in the bucket the, thing oh yeah or what was i gonna say the the nail that sticks up gets hammered down yep yep yeah the, very, whole, the whole very... it's it's a british colonial thing right like just the taking the piss out of you thing yeah but there's also in canada there's like a weird relationship to success and failure and especially success is measured by uh, having americans paying attention to you because mm -hmm. it's sort of like uh, there's an attitude of like, I don't know, people get very proud of the fact that anybody outside of Canada is paying attention to you because it's like, well, if you have a Canadian reputation, people outside of Canada don't know about you. You can't be any good. So, you know, you're only somebody until you make it in the United States. But then if you make it in the United States, then everybody is just like... Not everybody, but there's always going to be some people who are going to get butthurt about that and be like, what? yeah, well, why don't you stay in Canada? So. It's like singing in a Hawaiian steakhouse. 
Is it? Well, I'm just saying, you know, like, uh, actually, because what I wanted to talk with you about today was, you know, this essay, Taboo, Time and Belief in Exotica, which I think I told you over email, I sent to Mitch Mignano because I found myself kind of pegged in an uncomfortable way by this essay after he and I had an extensive conversation about his sort of ironic hipster adoration of this album of Hawaiian steakhouse music. Oh. <laughs> that you know that it was just yeah. sort of like yeah you're you're winning on the terms of the colony you know <laughs> and this essay to to spoil it for people you know finds my sort of critical voice in this conversation to be rather uh, dour and unimaginative i think sort of missing the point at least that's what i got out of it you're thinking that the way you habitually think about the stuff that i write about in this essay constitutes what I characterize as missing the point in the essay. Yes. Or at least that, yeah, that, that I was. Maybe you're being hard on yourself. Maybe we need to unpack that. Yeah. So, so let's do that. Phil Ford, it's a pleasure to have you back for your <laughs> first you. uh, solo conversation on future fossils. Happy All Saints Day. Thank you. Happy two days before the election in the United States. I feel honored to be talking to you. Uh, possibly the last podcast conversation that you'll have before the election or indeed ever. <laughs> yeah, that is if, you know, if the if the uh, asteroid hits our planet on that yeah. day. As... Asteroid has just been waiting for its chance. It's just <laughs> it's like, OK, yes, just, just just waiting for us to beg for it. Yeah, just waiting for the time that we will really appreciate the asteroid. Yeah, the, like, the comedian last! behind the curtain. Finally, you know, relatedly, I saw a uh, a rather amusing meme this morning of a T-Rex watching the asteroid come to pummel Mexico at the end of the Cretaceous. And the T-Rex was going, oh, shit, the economy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, you know, like when we had you on the show the first time, it was talking about the sort of uh, explicit upfront theme of Weird Studies podcast. Mm -hmm. But I think such a big piece of that show and especially of the little extra refs that you've been throwing out on the Weird Studies Patreon, which are like the lectures from your actual music course at IU Bloomington, I think are really important in their the way that they animate those conversations that that you and JF are having. And as a musician and the husband of someone with a music degree, I really admire your perspective on music and music history. And so, uh, yeah, really looking forward to discussing this piece with you because there's so much in here that I feel speaks to the themes that I like to explore on this show about where we are in the modern world and it's unraveling. Mm. So why don't you, uh, if, if you could, if you could kind of just give people a quick summary of, of this paper and, and also maybe what motivated you to write it in the first place, I think that would be were you in Austin at this time that you were writing this? That might explain it. Um, I'm trying to remember. It was so long ago. Uh, I think the, the very beginning of it actually was shortly after I had graduated with my PhD and got a job at Stanford for a couple of years, a non-tenure track job. And then somewhere in there, I started thinking about some of the ideas in this essay. Actually, where it started was with a line that Gary Snyder, beat poet and Buddhist, it's a line that he used, we are primitives of an unknown culture. Fuck. Okay, hold on for a second. I got to actually open up my own stupid thing. I wrote it yes. a long time yes, ago. Yes, it I is. Need... You start the essay with that quote. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's um, the one. Okay. Going into my inactive writing projects folder. Because uh, this is an old one. Okay, hold. I, I'm assuming that you edit and that uh, these longer, as I'm like looking in my. Oh, we'll we'll just play folder, some. Can... We'll play some uh, Muzak during this part. <laughs> okay, very good. Excellent. <laughs> um, where the fuck is it? Okay, here it is. Which, which, by the way, you know, it's just to just to kind of again spoil things. It's funny because you know, Muzak is what you listen to in the elevator, which is between places, which kind of speaks to the liminality of a culture stuck between 
its own time and place and some exotic other time and place. It's an interesting thought. And maybe especially those glass elevators. I'm always fascinated by those. You know, because it's sort of trying to tell you, like, the world is yours. Look, look out there. It is all laid out before you for your the, power and pleasure. In the but lobby of, course, of the hotel, yeah. Yeah, but of course, you're just stuck in a box that's going up and down, you know. So, Looking anyway. into the indoor jungle in the hotel lobby. Indeed. Yeah. Anyway, so about this essay, yeah, I started thinking about it when I was, like, a postdoc after graduating. And... I'd gotten really interested in exotica pop, like mid-century exotica pop, like by Les Baxter is probably the biggest name in the in the in the that genre of music. Martin Denny is another name that might be familiar to people. Uh, but this is music that, as I like to say, is film music for daydreams. You know, it's music that deploys recognizable vocabulary of film music isms to depict imaginary places or imaginary versions of actual places and places stocked with conventionalized others. You know, this is music that now is in rather bad odor. It feels pretty racist and seems to carry with it a lot of colonial assumptions. I mean, okay, I'd just say it does, you know, rather than seems to. Uh, <laughs> let's just be real here. But at the same time, this is music that I felt on some intuitive level has more going on in it than just like you can say okay this is a this is a vestige of colonialism this is a cold war fantasy of sexualized and conventionalized others who exist for the globe trotting cold war american to to disport themselves among and or at least to sit in your space age cocktail lounge with a martini in your hand imagining that you were doing so you know the social critique comes readily to our lips and it's certainly not irrelevant but i got really interested in another way of thinking about this music and other kinds of expressive culture that are making some of the same moves so like you know any number of like jungle picks but also like lines in like the movie fight club i remember going out and seeing fight club when i was in graduate school and there's a line that tyler durden or actually there's like a monologue tyler durden gets into which i am in fact going to read from because this is the epigram of the piece that i wrote we wanted to blast the world free of history we were eating breakfast in the house on paper street and Tyler said, picture yourself planting radishes and seed potatoes on the 15th green of a forgotten golf course. You'll hunt elk through the damp canyon forests round the ruins of Rockefeller Center and dig clams next to the skeleton of the Space Needle leaning at a 45 degree angle. We'll paint the skyscrapers with huge totem faces and goblin tikis, and every evening what's left of mankind will retreat to empty zoos and lock itself in cages as protection against bears and big cats and wolves that pace and watch us from outside the cage bars at night. Imagine, Tyler said, stalking elk past department store windows and stinking racks of beautiful rotting dresses and tuxedos on, on hangers. You'll wear leather clothes that will last you the rest of your life, and you'll climb the wrist-thick kudzu vines that wrap the Sears Tower. Jack and the Beanstalk, you'll climb up through the dripping forest canopy, and the air will be so clean you'll see tiny figures pounding corn and laying strips of venison to dry in the empty carpool lane of an abandoned superhighway stretching eight lanes wide in August hot for a thousand miles. That's a passage from... Mm. Yeah, and that's isn't that juicy? I feel like we could talk a whole hour just about that passage, but uh, you know that it was that's a passage from the book on which the film Fight Club is based, also titled Fight Club. And you know that is an example of that wavelength, that frequency, that vibration I was catching from a lot of mid-century exotica pop, and that frequency has something to do with the collision of temporal horizons of a forgotten lost time out of mind archaic past colliding with the ultra modern present indeed the future you know you have this sort of collision of time horizons such that 
in the uncanniness of that collision, each of those horizons preserves its own identity, its own particular savor. And so you have this kind of almost like a surrealist juxtaposition. And, you know, it's not just mid-century pop that did that. Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring is a good example of this. Some of the beat imagination had to do with this. The phrase, we are primitives of an unknown culture, came from a Japanese poet, Nanao Sakaki. And Sakaki is a poet who influenced Snyder, among others. And that line, we are primitives of an unknown culture, seems to me to sum up this kind of um, this, this vibration that I feel in a lot of different cultural forms, where you imagine yourself, you project yourself into an intimate relationship with an unknown, archaic, possibly imaginary past. You know, maybe a past that never really existed, and yet you project yourself imaginatively into it. And the degree of projection into it can be sometimes pretty remarkable. People can actually decide to become primitives of an unknown culture and live that way. You could live that way your entire life. You know, yeah. this I idea of, you know, culture being something that you can inhabit, that you can put on like a suit, or it's like a building you can walk around in a house you can live in as, as a way of transforming your reality. I and mean, anybody who listens to weird studies knows that I'm really interested in like the Western esoteric tradition, magic, all that sort of thing. And I think a lot of my interest in writing about this stuff come from the work I did on this, because it's in this essay that I first started getting really interested in the idea of like, people using music as a time travel device, people using pieces of culture as a way of imagining and actuating, actualizing alternative realities. And these realities have to do with that collision of different incommensurate temporal horizons. So in a nutshell, that's what this essay is about. So this First of all, this is great, and we'll link to it in the show notes, because I think you articulate all this very masterfully. You manage to toe the line with sort of the, the academic voice, but to do it in a way that I found really artful and, and pleasurable to read. Um, Thank you. But like there's 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 a thread in here that you make really clear, which is that this isn't just happening in music, but this is also linked very intimately with, especially you know like that that music you just you characterize immediately as cinematic music without the movie right and there's something about you know i was talking with you and eric davis and jeremy johnson a couple other people on twitter a week or so ago about the sort of rupture between the the real quote unquote you know as it's naively taken and the imaginal in cinema over the last few decades like specifically cinema about video games but before we before i like try to make that connection i just want to draw the the delicious constellation between Fight Club, and then also 12 Monkeys, which is a movie in which you literally see the human beings caging themselves underground mm. after all of the animals escape from the zoos. And, and right. also the, the, the plague, the contagion that sweeps over the surface of the planet and forces human society underground. And that's a time travel movie. And then that movie also, there's a theme in that movie that we see in Jurassic Park, which I mean, not a day goes by that I don't feel like, sorry, folks, you, you, not a day goes by, you don't hear me talk about Jurassic Park, but not a day goes by where I don't feel like that movie has come true in some weird way, you mm -hmm. know, that we are all living in our cages in quarantine in this pandemic, while the dinosaurs of what WJT Mitchell called the, the biocybernetic and the time of, of biocybernetic reproduction have escaped and have taken over the daylight world and that there's a risk that we court and that I think that we have succumbed to a kind of a Pandora's box thing in our indulgence of these particular imaginative sojourns because by like, you've talked a lot about hyperstition on weird studies mm -hmm. and the way that simply going through the motions of the story invokes it and actualizes it and that you know the more we tell a story the more true it becomes uh, until we get to a point where 
we, we may try to render something in fiction and therefore to gain some distance from it, which you talk about as sort of the performance of Exotica. It's this weird blend between the, you know, the, you know, I'll, I'll, there's a there's a huge sort of sexual current to it of like oh, yeah. the white colonial adventurer and the mm-hmm. exotic foreigner. Right. And there's something about trying to like portray something in order to make it the other by which we define our own civilized sensibility that mm-hmm. undermines the entire practice of it. And so like the only way to actually undo that is to forget it. But by we, we keep rendering these things in such a way that they continue to use us basically as a vessel through which they instantiate themselves. And and so, you know, you get into this, you link this to, and I, I'd like you to maybe unpack this piece of it a little bit. You link this to the spectacle, which I think yeah. again is like a big piece of this thing of like Jurassic Park, where they have that conversation with the geneticist Henry Wu. And he's they're like, well, in the book, it was John Hammond asking him he's like you know we having this conversation where it's like we these aren't real dinosaurs you know these are a, a a capitalist fiction of what a dinosaur is this is like what we think tourists want to see and imagine is a dinosaur and then john hammond in the book and henry Wu in, in the movie are both like well who gives a shit like it doesn't matter and you get into that that whole thing about the poli- the aestheticized politics of the spectacle and i think that's mm-hmm. yeah. that's a really interesting piece here and rant one of the, one thing that I, one interesting little fact about Les Baxter, a comp- the composer who is, as I say, kind of the godfather of the mid-century orchestral pop exotica style. If you've ever heard of Ema Sumac, the singer, her most famous album, Voice of the Tabe, which is spelled X-T-A-B-A-Y, uh, A-Y, but pronounced Tabe. He's the guy who did the music for that, right? And he's sort of an interesting cat because he had you know, background in jazz and he had a lot of classical composition chops. A lot of the moves that he makes in exotica pop really come from Debussy, Ravel, and Stravinsky. A lot of the stylistic music, stylistic features of that music kind of come from that. But uh, he also had an interesting checkered, varied career, which included writing music for theme parks. And if memory serves, particularly the kind that have like orca whales, the sort of SeaWorld type place, mm, places, yeah, yeah. I think he did at least one of those. So, you know, that's a great example. A place like um, a SeaWorld type place where you have, or really just any zoo, you know, you have a staging of nature. And That's an inherently contradictory notion, right? A staging of nature. But there's an aspect of the spectacle in that. But then at the same time, you're actually having to create a functional environment for these animals and a lot of, a lot of um, care uh, goes into that. Right. But think of it as a, from a point of view of like entertainment, you're serving up a little slice of the real world, like actual animals from the world taken, of course, from their environments and brought to like Indianapolis or wherever you happen to be. But it's a spectacle of that. And it is done up in a way to kind of hit you with like drama. It's an aesthetic presentation. And so, sure, ask Les Baxter to write some music for that to enhance your experience of nature. That's uh, an interesting sort of contradictory notion. That, the, the contradiction that lies at the heart of saying, you know, a spectacle of nature, that contradiction is something that I'm trying to get or was trying to get at in this, in this piece that I wrote. The, uh, there's a line of George Burns that I always like to quote, sincerity is everything. If you can fake that, you got it made. Mm. And... I've always been fascinated by that particular kind of of uh, that kind of paradox, the idea of faked sincerity or faked authenticity, uh, a staging of the real. Because what's interesting about it, and it took me a long time to really kind of come around to this way of thinking, but realizing that there is a kind of there is a kind of real that emerges from the fakery that in the fakery. 
actually, there's another line by Jane Foyer, who wrote a wonderful book about film musicals. I love film musicals, by the way. Talk about spectacle. And she has a great line. She's like, peel away the tinsel and you'll find the true tinsel underneath. You know, uh, that sense that like the tinsel has its own reality, it is its own real. This kind of thing is what Umberto Eco and others called um, the hyper real, hyper reality. Daniel Borston wrote a book, I think it was back in the 50s. I used to remember when these things were written. I can't remember a damn thing anymore, but on pseudo spectacles, like, you know, things like a photo opportunity where you are staging something like, uh, to use a rather dark example, when Trump used strong arm to like beat and gas and kick out a bunch of people who were peacefully protesting outside a church that he wanted to use for his photo op. The fakery of that is obvious, right? He even held the fucking Bible upside down, which is a, a detail I particularly <laughs> enjoyed. And as somebody pointed out, he was holding the Bible as if it was burning him. You know, it's like he <laughs> was holding this thing like, what the fuck is this thing? What do you do with this? The fakery of it was obvious, right? This is a guy who doesn't give a shit about religion or <laughs> basic human decency. Sorry, I'm bringing a political note to your show. Um, it's okay, because we we actually could go through this. This this actually does connect us rather awkwardly, but nonetheless poetically to Super Mario Brothers 1993. Nice. Which you know is like uh, I, I I know I'm not the first person to note that. Donald Trump looks exactly like Dennis Hopper's President Koopa in oh, that film. You're right. Which is like so it's so and it's funny because he was the the mogul of Dino Hatton as to be contrasted with Manhattan. Wow. You know, which is like um, I gotta watch that movie. Yeah, I we I rewatched it a week or so ago and I was just impressed because I, I was like, you know, it's it's you you watch like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 as a kid and you think it's great, you watch it as an adult and it's just total crap. But like Super Mario Brothers to me seems like even though people panned it, even though Bob Hoskins said it was like the worst move of his career, I find it to be so, so prescient, you know, in part because it's doing what we're talking about here, which is it's taking a known fiction and unlike a meta fiction, which like observes that it's a fiction in this cheeky kind of self-referential way, Super Mario Brothers and then later Sonic the Hedgehog, which feels like thematically like it plagiarized. Super Mario Brothers, and then also Masters of the Universe in 1987. Oh, yeah. All three of these With movies Dolph are taking Lundgren. a cartoon or a video game and then positing it in a live action film as though it were actually a parallel dimension that actually exists right. and then rupturing the boundary between that dimension and, and our own. Mm. And that the, these, these feel to me like these are films that are actually about film itself. Hmm. And 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 so something about Super Mario Brothers, I feel like was a hyperstition or an inverse metafiction in that it allowed us to imagine a President Koopa. And I actually blame Super Mario Brothers for the Trump presidency in a way. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like it, it's because it's like we saw President Trump, you know, and we saw it and we we're like, oh, this is familiar to us already mm -hmm. like we can it's easy to imagine this guy in the seat of power because yeah. we've already cast this particular spell but yeah. anyway well i mean the whole trump presidency has been just you know creating like pseudo spectacles fake you know fake spectacles of the real right think a faked up version of the real so no he didn't just happen to be in front of that church he doesn't love the bible so much that he has to hold a copy of it upside down holding it like it's burning him um all of this is staged and of course it, it you know it, it aroused a lot of anger because in order to have his little staged moment he unleashed brutality against some of his fellow americans but the thing is the whole trump presidency has been bullshit spectacle like him with his plan that he supposedly was going to show the 60 minutes person Le leslie stall 
Oh yeah, no, we got the plan for healthcare, and it ends up being just a stack of un plain paper, like with nothing on it. And apparently, he's pulled <laughs> he's pulled that shit repeatedly. The 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 plain stack of plain paper that pretends to be contracts or a plan or some shit. That's like his thing. But the thing is, like, okay, everything is hollow. It's all spectacle. There's no substance to, it. and yet we've had four years of that motherfucker. Like, it's it's a spectacle that became like so real it couldn't be more real him and all of his this parallel reality that he actually managed to bring into the world the fakery of the real that became the real that ate the real this is i suppose the dark side of the kind of exotica stuff that i'm talking about i mean leaving aside the collision of temporal horizon stuff which is the more specific argument i'm making in this paper the more general thing is just being really fascinated by fictions that you can get up and walk around in. Fictions like an example I give is the the White Panther Party, which, although it sounds that sounds vaguely racist, it was actually a militant left group in the late 60s, founded by and led by John Sinclair, who at the time was sort of the manager for the MC5, legendary Detroit band, the MC5. Anyway, it was a commune of hippies who lived in a big shambling house in Ann Arbor who believed themselves to be liberated territory, to use a term that was popular at the time, like a like a, an autonomous nation in the belly of the beast. That was the, that was the idea. And Sinclair referred to himself as the minister of information. And one of his buddies was the minister for defense or whatever. And you can look at all of this stuff and say, well, I, this cannot be attempted to be believed. You're not an autonomous nation in the belly of the beast. You're a bunch of hippies in a house, a flop house in Ann Arbor. How can you imagine this reality in which you are like badass freedom fighters and where, in fact, you know, like if you're actually looking at what happened with that group, for all their brave talk, they, you know, they're mostly talked, like nothing really happened. No disrespect. I mean, you know, actually, I think John Sinclair was a pretty cool guy, and there were a lot of neat things about that scene. But then at the same time, like, you sort of say, like, okay, put down on your job application, previous employment, Minister of Information for the White Panther Party and White Panther Nation. You know what I mean? Like, that doesn't fit. That doesn't really work in our administrative society as a functional idea. That's just, so what's the reality claim to that? It has maybe the same ontological status as like the fort that a kid makes out of sofa cushions in the living room, right? It's a fort. Well, the kid, it's a fort. To, you know, mom and dad, it's just like, well, put those cushions back on the sofa when you're done, please, you know? But the thing is that the, uh, people who made up the White Panther Party have lived inside that fiction for years. And you could say, well, yeah, but you didn't, you, you surely must have known you were just pretending, right? There must have been some corner of your mind where you were like, this is just pretend. We're just having a bit of fun here. But no, actually, the thing that's interesting, and this is why the word belief appears in the title of this piece, is that you can keep kicking that can down the road potentially forever. You don't need to engineer some kind of cognitive closure where you say, okay, well, what's really going on is that is X, but I'm pretending that Y is actually what's going on. No, you just act upon the belief that Y is what it is, that, you know, Y is happening, that Y, as opposed to X, is reality. And if you do that long enough, it turns out that you can actually make the equivalent of a child's sofa cushion fort actually be a real fort. I mean, for all intents and purposes, and getting back to Donald Trump, that in a certain sense, that is what he did. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all bullshit. It's all empty stacks of paper pretending to be actual books. And yet that ended up being a reality that all of us have been forced to live in for the last four years. So the boundary between what we think of as reality and what we think of as imagination I may be accustomed to thinking of those things as being distinct but uh, it turns out it's a lot more porous than it appears and you know what am I talking about here I'm talking about exotica but I'm also talking about magic the ability to create new realities by basically faking it until you make it so yeah I, th I feel like that's something that's at stake in all of this
Yes, indeed. I'm glad I'm glad that we were able to draw the line directly into the heart of weird studies because there's this, you know, this brings up a lot for me, especially when you bring up the, the whole theme park thing again to flog Jurassic Park's undead corpse here. But I don't know if you ever read William Irwin Thompson's The American Replacement of Nature or no. um, oh, fantastic book. He spends a good piece of that as well as at the edge of history talking about Disney because he, he grew up in in L.A. And, and you know, my, I, I found that book and especially both of those reads, especially awkward in a like I feel called out kind of way because mm-hmm. I grew up in amusement parks like my, my father worked for Universal Studios and then Disney together okay. for like over 20 years. Oh, wow. And so I, I grew up much like the fecal transplant that I claim to be at the Santa Fe Institute. I grew up going into those parks through the back door. And mm. Bill Thompson talks about Disney as a spatialization of time. You know, you go to Frontierland or you go yeah. to 19th century British explorer of Africa, or, you know, you go to pre-colonial China or Japan. You know, there's like all of these but you're walking around in these landscapes. You go to the space age in Tomorrowland mm-hmm. and it's unpacked in a network of physical locations in what he considered kind of prophetic in the, like a Marshall McLuhan way that the electronic media surround has collapsed time and space, which I think is you know a point you invoke in this essay, you, you know, to talking mm-hmm. about Marshall McLuhan, talking about progress as was it moving forward in the rear view which is yeah. what the T-Rex in Jurassic Park is doing. But so like That's Bill true. Thompson Bill Thompson talks about evil specifically as something that is outside of its time. He says, you know, Godzilla would not be evil in the Jurassic period, but because it's in modern Tokyo, it is. And mm-hmm. so, you know, Godzilla is matter out of place, which is the Burning Man term, you know, for we can put our imaginal moonscape futurist utopia here in the desert a temporary autonomous zone like the white panther party's uh, symbionia Mm -hmm. but if we leave a trace here then that's evil and it's funny because sorry this is just like a a sort of schizoidal string of references but like burning man was hugely inspired by hakeem bey's book temporary autonomous zones ontological anarchy poetic terrorism and other essays and he makes this point in that book that his whole notion is that the empire was never founded, that like ontological anarchy is that we don't have to indulge in some sort of exotic fantasy in order to reclaim a sort of pre-modern tribal reality because we've been living in it the whole time in the modern era and we're just bullshitting ourselves. Yeah. And to, to that point, you know, it's really funny that the whole narrative conflict in Super Mario Brothers is President Koopa hates plumbers whose job it is to clean up bullshit, right? That's... Mm. So there's, I don't know, there's there's something about the rupture in another book coming into being, Bill Thompson talks about the Rig Veda and how the Rig Veda talks about how the beasts and the humans teamed up and repressed, imprisoned the spirit world. And he's saying that we've reached the end of that world age through electronic media and that the spirits are coming back through, which is something you talk about on Weird Studies a lot. Sure. And in in that inversion, we get what William Irwin Thompson calls about the alt-right movement, the ghost dance of the rednecks, where the technocratic world age, like the 12 monkeys thing, or like they talk about in Fight Club, is taking the humans of modernity and encasing them in technological confinement, which we are Mm -hmm. again here in quarantine, and then flipping it and putting the spirit world back on top. And that in the technocratic suppression of the human scale and the sort of wild humanity, you know, we end up in this this thing where this whole alt-right Trump thing is sort of a death rattle at the end of a like a pre-Borg human age. Hmm. And so like bullshit reigns in this world, but it's, as you, as you make a point in this essay, like that there is something, and you know, you talk a lot about this in some of the episodes you've done about like uh, Nick Land and Graham Harmon, you know, object oriented ontology, that there is something about the aesthetic that, you know, those guys are all saying that the aesthetic is the causal. And that's a note that you kind of end this essay on that the, the world of appearances matters more than the modern world likes to give it credit. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
So I don't know where you want to poke into that, but that's just like a lot. I could just like barf up on the table and let you run with. Well, you know, one of the figures that I talk about a lot in this essay is a guy named Jack Smith, who is a radical queer performance artist before anybody had invented radical queer performance art. Jack Smith was a really remarkable, sui generis artist who lived in... He was sort of in the New York scene in the late 50s and the 1960s. He's best known for a film that called Flaming Creatures, which is a, a notorious sort of underground film, notorious because it was uh, it shows it has sexual imagery that very much shocked the, I believe, Congress. It was banned for a while or impossible to find. Anyway, it's one of those sort of underground uh, legends of the underground. Jack Smith was fascinated by what he called moldy glamour. He was he loved old jungle flicks. His his muse was the Dominican actress Maria Montez, who appeared in such films as Cobra Woman, which is a I believe an MGM jungle pick, and it's not very good. You can sometimes find it online. I was saying it's not very good is a I mean, it's really cheesy. It is the perfect example of like totally cheesy, uh, obvious fake exotica imagining of like, you know, some non-existent South Seas culture where an evil woman, uh, an evil queen reigns over her subject people and she throws them into volcanoes and blah, 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 that kind of, you know, lurid 40s vintage stuff. Smith loved that stuff. And in fact, actually, I'm hoping one of these days, JF and I can do an episode on weird studies on an essay, a little essay by Jack Smith called On the Perfect Filmic Appositeness of Maria Montez. And this essay blew my mind when I found it. Actually, just Jack Smith generally blew my mind when I discovered him. But this essay in particular, because he is talking about a lot of the things that we're talking about and talking about what it is to inhabit a purely aestheticized reality, to what it what it is for your aesthetic commitments to become your reality commitments, you know? And so there's a, a line right at the end of this wonderful essay by Jack Smith where he writes, and this is also the end of my own essay, I finished this article. A friend, David Guren, came to tell me, I came to tell you, tonight I saw a young man in the street with a plastic rose in his mouth, declaiming, I am Maria Montez. A nutty manifestation, true, but in some way a true statement. Some way we must come to understand that person. And that's what Jack Smith says. And... Where I conclude is saying that, you know, the conventional academic way of approaching exotica or indeed almost anything is to insist that there is a real world, there's an imaginary world that is parasitic on that real world, and that the arrow goes from the real world to the imaginary world. Uh, but especially in a kind of um, a Marxist context, if anything resembling an orthodox Marxism, which you still find a lot in the academic humanities, at least traces of it, the impulse is always to insist upon a kind of material reality that any aesthetic reality is going to be, you know, parasitic on. And I'm going to just, rather than try and paraphrase what I wrote, I'm just going to read the last paragraph that I wrote in this article by way of commentary on the passage I just read from Jack Smith. The critical sensibility policing the border between real and imaginary that Exotica keeps trying to erase, and of course, by now, realize it's not just pop Exotica, it's this whole complex of cultural manifestations. Uh, the, the critical sensibility by policing that border between real and imaginary does not understand that person, that nutty person who is holding the red rose, plastic rose in his mouth and saying, I am Maria Montez. In our hermeneutic regime, the young man with the plastic rose remains forever outside on the street, his devotion unnoticed or pitied. And what I say is that I'm trying to come up with a hermeneutics, a style of interpretation within which this guy makes some kind of sense, which for me means trusting the material fullness of images, even the most avowedly faked 
of images. And when I say image, I don't just mean a visual image. Um, those musical, musico semiotic things that give us like film music beats, even if it's just in orchestral pop music, those make images too. If you hear like a big gong blast and a in a in a in a pentatonic melody, anybody who spent a lot of time watching old Charlie Chan movies is going to be like, ah, the Mysterious Orient, right? <laughs> and the Mysterious Orient is not an actual place in the world; it's a place in the imagination. And if we say Oh, calling something, you know, talking about the mysterious Orient is, you know, it's colonizing and centralizing, it's kind of racist and so on. All that might be true, but an image like that, whether a musical image or the complementary visual image or, you know, somebody being tossed into a volcano, that image has its own reality, a kind of a, a material fullness, a richness. There is a kind of an iridescent power. Uh, shining forth from these images that Jack Smith's art basically exists to mine that, to, to, to capture that magic or that luminous power from the most stock, the most conventionalized, the, mo the cheesiest, flimsiest, most see-throughable of images. To, to look at those images and to see them not as cheesy, fakery as as a simulacrum of the real but to see it as something that has its own powerful reality and to be able to participate in that reality unless you can do that this stuff is always going to sound like cheap and silly and vaguely wrong but in this essay i'm trying to encourage people to you know i i wouldn't have phrased this when i wrote this thing it was eventually published in 2009 but it, most of it was written years earlier at that time, I didn't know shit from Shinola about magic and the Western esoteric tradition, didn't care about any of that stuff. But what I know now, I mean, looking at this thing that I wrote years ago is like, well, well, what I was talking about was magic. And I was trying to find a way of honoring the power of images, you know, such as one might find in the tarot, find the, the images such as one might find in a you know, in a Catholic church, the images of saints and martyrs in the stained glass windows, to trust these things as images that have a kind of an autonomous power, rather than seeking to reduce them to this or that social force or, to, or using the means of critique to break them down and say that they are a manifestation of this or a manifestation of that, a symptom of this or a symptom of that. All of those styles of thought that come naturally to academics, if you were looking at a lot of this culture sort of with those techniques, it just shrivels away. You know, I, I was talking about film musicals before. Peel away the tinsel and you find the true tinsel underneath. If you're looking at film musicals and you're like, okay, I got to figure out something to do with this. I got to make something of this. You know, a Ginger Rogers, Fred Astaire, RKO picture from the 30s. And so I'm going to talk about, I don't know, something valuable, something that matters. Gender politics, for example. Yeah, okay, that's fine. But then you're dissolving something that exists as an image, as an aesthetic event, into messages, into ideas, into propositional meanings. And in so doing, arguably, you're hardly even seeing the movie anymore. You're hardly seeing those images. Those images are just becoming pretexts for meanings that you will soon feel are, you can use those meanings to replace the sensuous immediacy of the artwork. You don't even need the artwork. All you need is, a, is the artwork as a pretext for a certain mode of critique or a certain style of analytic approach. And uh, I guess I was just trying to get people to understand there's this other dimension to those spectacles, those manifestations. And without understanding that dimension, the nutty guy with the plastic rose in his mouth is always just going to seem like a nutty guy with a plastic rose in his mouth, rather than being as he was in that moment to himself. He was Maria Montez, not a guy pretending to be Maria Montez. He was Maria Montez. I don't know. I, I just got through this whole rant and uh, I've gotten to the end, and I'm not sure that makes sense even to me. Oh, it does. What do you, what well, do you think, Michael? Does well, that make you know, sense to you? 
one of my favorite songs that I discovered this year is uh, Phoebe Bridger's song Halloween, where she says, "Baby, it's Halloween, and we can be anything." Yeah, you know? yeah. like that's and then so that speaks to you know it's been a long time since I had John David Ebert on the show, but are you familiar with his film criticism? The guy is extraordinary, a difficult guy to get along with, but a brilliant guy to listen to. You know, he, he one of the things he was talking about was when I had him on the show for Blade Runner 2049, back on episode 65, he, you know, he was talking about how in that show, when uh, Kay, the protagonist, goes to the ruins of Las Vegas, and he goes into the casino, and it's these huge holograms of Elvis Presley and Marilyn Monroe mm -hmm. inhabiting this space, and then he finds Rick Deckard, and, and Rick Deckard ends up going back to the the android factory and is presented with an in the flesh avataric reconstruction of his lost love, the replicant Rachel. Right. And so there's this theme in that, in that story about, you know, the, the, that this question, which we've been, you know, chewing over, which is how do we navigate these realms where the simple categories of naive realism are no longer sufficient as bearings for us. And Ebert talks a lot about avatarism and the internet and how, you know, the way that we, the sort of the rhetoric of the World Wide Web was like Phoebe Bridgers talks about Halloween. It's that you can be anything, you know, you can be, a, you know, the, the classic example of like a, you know, chubby middle-aged white guy masquerading as a 14-year-old vixen oh, wow. or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it seems like the, you know, the big challenge for us in this is how to relate to the ways in which that both is and is not true. You know, that when Ebert's YouTube channel was demonetized by YouTube and he, he tried to fight it, he talks about the people that went down to the, you know, that had a similar issues, livelihoods depended on this projection of their avataric identity online. And when someone else, when, you know, when they put some real piece of themselves into this, this uh, mirror world, and then that gives someone else agency over them, like a fiat agency over the person you present yourself to be. And then when they shut it down and then they claim that they can do nothing to bring back your YouTube channel, then it makes sense that people would go down to the YouTube headquarters with a gun because they're now defending a, an attack on what the world claims to be virtual, but which has, uh -huh. yeah. which has it's real in a way that in certain ways, the person that you are when the internet when you lose power to your apartment is not and cannot be. And so it's, again, it is this, this thing about, I love you. You, you have a, a piece of this essay where you talk about pro wrestling and, yeah. and you say to cl complain that pro wrestling is fake or that exotic is inauthentic is to miss the point. In either case, we might say like Roland Barthes, that Barthes, that the public is completely uninterested in knowing whether the contest is rigged or not, and rightly so, it abandons itself to the primary virtue of the spectacle, which is to abolish all motives and all consequences. What matters is not what it thinks, but what it sees. And so this gets into this question again of like, you know, Trump and Putin and right. how do you walk this line? How do you develop this nuanced relationship to the real and to the hyper real and hypo and, and surreal? without falling into nihilism because like when i yeah. when i think about this in respect with like respect to deep fakes you know there's something where york university philosopher regina rini calls the epistemic backstop which is that we all just sort of took the photo finish or the you know the the uh surreptitious tape recorder someone snuck into mitt romney's meeting as an actual as admissible evidence as like mm -hmm. proof of something that happened mm -hmm. which again is is an invitation and a, a temporal rupture you know that we're saying that this 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 thing that was real is real but the more sophisticated we get at counterfeiting media the more that breaks down and it seems like the more it breaks down the more people sort of end up retreating into a fuck it i don't even i don't even care anymore and there's like there's a right way and a wrong way to do that and i'm yeah. really curious kind of how you how you feel when we talk about again the the sort of technophilia of of a 1950s suburban white dude listening on his hi-fi to an exotica record as himself encrusted by technology i think right about right. the um for one how you know richard doyle in darwin's pharmacy talks about trying to extract psychoactive compounds from their phytochemical matrix as somehow like ironic or enantiodromic in that you're, you 
are removing something from its own organic ecology by surrounding it with an ecology of technological adjuncts. Like you need a chemistry lab to do this. Yeah. And so it's also last weird little hang pin I'll throw in this is this is reminiscent of an article that got a huge amount of traction in the, <laughs> in the Future Fossils Facebook group because it's hilarious that popular science reported that there's a, a weird convergent evolution of all these different lineages of crustaceans into crabs, that something, something about the form of the crab is a strong attractor basin, that it's like, wow. it's in, in many different cases, it's like the simplest. And somebody brought up that this reminded them of like Samurai and, and Gundam and J Japan's fascination with putting yourself in a me mechanical armor. Hmm. So I don't know that there's, that's a lot, but like, basically it's like there, there are strategies for navigating this that again, seem like they are a form of de-evolution that we're yeah. falling down the slump into crabhood here, yeah. Yeah. but it's a, it's a strong, it's a strong attractor. So like how the, how the hell do we navigate this and maintain our dignity or like make sure that we are growing up and not just like slumping into nihilistic Borg bullshit. I mean, it's so easy to see how badly all of this can go. All of the ideas that I was playing with, like, you know, back in the aughts when I, when I was working on this essay, um, in a way, it's all pretty obvious now in a way that it wasn't, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Uh, now nobody needs to be schooled on the indeterminate boundary between the spectacle and the real or the spectacle becoming its own reality because like i said we've been living with this for four years and so clearly we've all had a lot of practice in seeing how all of this can go very badly wrong sometimes i sort of feel like it's easy to read for example marshall McLuhan and have and read him talking about all of the transformations that would happen in society as a result of electronic media and things that he saw coming that turned out to be absolutely right for example that idea of the global village the idea that the conditions of a village where a single person can speak and the entire community can hear that person's voice in real time the idea that those conditions can be inflated to global scale and now the person speaking and being heard by the village in the in the agora is like the equivalent of that is of course social media right he saw all this shit coming long before the best possible examples of like he was talking about TV and radio and stuff and his ideas about how these things would have something to do with, for example, a global village um, it was seen very remote and speculative. And now, you know, now that we have different technologies, we have the internet and social media and so on. His ideas are actually much easier to understand. Okay. So like, People always seem to assume that McLuhan was looking at these things and being affirmative about them, like liking the idea that society would transform in this way, that would we would be more intimately involved in one another's lives. And he was often at pains to say, no, I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it's happening. And And I'm also saying that you should know what's happening so that you can have some abilities to deal with it. So you have some tools. And I think that there's something similar going on here, I'm not comparing myself to Marshall McLuhan by any means, but what I was writing about here is, as I say, become much more legible since the, you know, the rise of Donald Trump and Trumpism generally. And not just that. I mean, you know, there are many other examples around the world of kind of pro wrestling kayfabe being enacted on a societal level through uh, demagogues and uh, you know would be dictators. Uh, but you know, I feel like I feel like it's like everything else. It's a two edged sword. Like I was focusing here on all the things you don't get to do, all the things you don't get to see or hear or just perceive. If you are stuck in too, I don't know, too straightforwardly intellectualizing a mode, 
you're not going to be able to you know perceive the fullness of the image right well that sounds great we all love the fullness of the image that sounds like something that you might want to be involved with but then like digging the fullness of the image might also mean participating in this noxious trumpist cult uh and enacting huge systemic damage on this country and many other countries besides so clearly there's a sort of ambiguity here it's neither good nor bad it's just a thing you know McLuhan liked to point out, hey, the conditions of the global village, it's not a cakewalk. It's very agonistic, you know? It's like the conditions of a village, like people quarrel all the time. There's much less individualism and there's much less privacy. If you like the idea of privacy, you're not going to like the electronic age. He turned out to be absolutely right about that. And likewise, just like I've been saying all along, what I was really writing about in this essay was magic. And hey, there's good magic and bad magic. Well, there's white magic and there's black magic. It all sounds pretty white or gray, at least. It seems pretty neutral when we're just talking about Jack Smith really digging on Maria Montez, watching old cheap jungle movies starring Maria Montez and kind of projecting himself into that entire world. That sounds benign. It, so, it sounds much less benign when we have somebody who's doing something similar, but the reality he's projecting himself into is some kind of birth of a nation, white supremacist fantasy. And so, I suppose, you know, on weird studies, I would, I, I, I suppose, to put on to 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 say something, I would say if I were on weird studies, I'd say the the trick is to become a better magician. Mm. You know. I kind of think about Trump almost the way I think about like an invasive species, you know, a species that uh, you bring to an ecosystem that's not prepared for it. And then that thing just takes over like rabbits in Australia. Right. Yeah. At a certain point, I imagine an ecosystem will reach a certain kind of homeostasis that predators will evolve to fill niches to rebalance the ecosystem against some formerly very successful uh, uh, new introduction. And it just takes a while. It takes a while for, actually, I'm now I'm, I'm saying this, I, I might be just talking complete bullshit with this, uh, uh, with this invasive species analogy, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, an invasive species is invasive, is able to like take over an ecosystem partly because like there aren't any predators for it. Like there's no, that ecosystem doesn't have something to oppose it, something to keep it in check. So it rages out of control. Well, it's very, that's very William Irwin Thompson's Godzilla again. Oh, okay. Evil, evil is matter out of place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, you we have a species out of place, and it can and it can enjoy untrammeled success for a while until whatever adjustments happen in the ecosystem that are going to reintroduce some kind of limit on that organism's ability to reproduce. Likewise, I feel like there has been this bend in reality itself, <laughs> some transformation in our social reality, at any rate, our cultural reality, where, in a sense, like. It's not just that we're living in a magical revival where people are more interested in tarot and astrology and so on. This happens every few decades. There's an uptick in interest in the occult. Well, there's that. But I also think that that's, that weird permeability of the boundary between matter and mind, between intention, like say aesthetic to intention, and forms of life, that boundary becoming more and more permeable the all of the things that we've talked about in this conversation and that i've said you know that in this essay i was talking about as exotica but like i'm more apt to think about as a kind of magic now well that is the invasive species right and or perhaps i would say it would be more accurate to say that somebody who just inhabits the world of kayfabe Kayfabe is the term of art used for the professional wrestling kind of like real fakery where people are pretending 
that you know say that there's a beef between two wrestlers and that pretending can go pretty deep like you can keep that going for a long time and you can have it spill over into the real world in all kinds of ways to the extent that it becomes difficult to understand what's kayfabe and what's to use professional wrestling lingo what's a shoot what's like an unsimulated beef between two wrestlers right if you get somebody who lives in that world of kayfabe and donald trump is un imaginable with it like he's he's not understandable unless you understand professional wrestling and unless you understand the world of professional wrestling and how kayfabe works when by the way trump himself was like involved to some extent in professional wrestling unless you really understand that you're going to be defenseless against that motherfucker because he's going to be able to pull moves on you that you won't see coming and you won't understand and, you know, there's so many people who who are like, oh, but he's telling a lie and I can prove it and blah, blah, blah. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you can prove that Donald Trump is telling a lie. Because simply in telling the lie and acting upon it and getting a bunch of people who are all consensually existing in this in that same reality that he created, you can make lies not come true, but you can make them become effectual things in the world not just counterfeits of reality, but their own reality. Until you understand how that man is doing what he's doing, he will be like rabbits in Australia, just fucking taking over everything. Because, you know, it's like we haven't evolved, we, we haven't evolved the means of limiting that, understanding it, keeping it in its place, or coming up with countermeasures. We haven't figured that out. After four long years of this, I think actually people are figuring it out. I've like many people sort of fascinated by the ads that Lincoln Project puts out because they're so effective and they're playing and they're playing on his playing field. They're playing games that allow them to lay to actually land shots on Trump. They're playing on the level of images, you know, they're, they are trusting point, the fullness of the image. To that point, have you seen Borat's subsequent movie film? No, sub- heard about movie it, of course. Film. Yeah. So, you know, there's that. There's this climax, if you will, of that film is when he and his, his fictional daughter prank Rudy Giuliani mm. into I've what seen, looks like... I've seen that clip, yeah. Yeah, and, and then, of course, Giuliani is doing exactly... It's, it's a brilliant move because whatever happened in that hotel room, Giuliani is forced onto his, his back foot into saying, it didn't happen. What you're seeing is a, is a, is a confabulation which is like is is proof that like you can be good at the offense, the kayfabe mm-hmm. offense, and yeah. be terrible at the kayfabe defense. Because like because right. Sasha Baron Cohen is nailing them at their own game. Yeah, he's saying exactly. like it, it doesn't matter what happened here because you're gonna yeah. be stuck defending yourself, saying that that's not a factual record. It doesn't seem like even the people who are good at wielding this double edged sword are good at defending themselves against it right now. And so it's like cancer versus cancer in a way. It's it's like, yeah. Well, you know, if cancer is the only thing that can beat cancer, then I'm in favor of cancer. You know what I mean? (laughs) Just, you know, but I mean, except like cancer is, you know, you never want to hear that you've got cancer, right? Uh, Whereas magic on its own, and obviously I'm using the term magic here to, to in the sort of like, kind of in an occult way in the sort of Crowley-esque, like, you know, acting upon re- um, the, the, the art, what, what does he say? The art and science of acting upon, uh, using will to act upon reality. I'm completely butchering that famous line of his, but, you know, using your intention uh, to make changes in reality. That on its own is, a, is neutral. It's not inherently good. It's not inherently bad. It's a tool. The first person who figured, I mean, it's like Donald Trump has been like the first guy to, to, to be armed with a gun. And so he's been spraying the block and his opponents don't have the same weapon. So they've been remarkably ineffectual until recently. And now, of course, anybody can figure out how to do that. You just have to kind of like inhabit the logic of kayfabe. And now you're seeing a lot of actors in the space beginning to figure out how to land on Trump and people like Trump. And then it just becomes a question of, it's sort of like, you know, a question about guns. Are guns good? Well, I don't know. Guns are destructive. Whether they're good or not depends on their use to some extent. Um, we might say, well, I would prefer a society without guns entirely. 
uh, and there might be some good reasons for that. But for as long as there's guns around, we hope that there are some people who will wield them righteously and others uh, against others who don't. And likewise, as long as we are living in this strange transmogrified world, a world that McLuhan saw coming and theorized, the strange transmogrified world where will does act upon reality in the most surprising and powerful ways, for as long as that is happening, then you better hope that some of the guys on your side have learned how to wield it effectively. That's not a moral argument. That's just an argument from self-preservation. Yeah, you know, which interestingly, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite fond of uh, the work of SFI professor Jessica Flack, who studied under Franz de Waal and, you know, has, has done some interesting work on primate hierarchies, looking at like, mm. you know, as, as a fan of televised fighting, I think, you know, you you might appreciate some of her stuff because it, it she talks about primate dominance hierarchies as a way for the primate troop as a collective individual to encode information about its environment. And I just shared a, a reflection piece uh, this guy wrote on um, Psychology Today on the SFI Twitter feed about this, about how her work and work of other people show that even though we want on some level you know, we being, you know, a lot of modern and, and postmodern people that we want to upend the modern democratic world space is, is about like dethroning and guillotining the kings. Right. But what that what that does, and many people have con commented on this about, you know, like the tyranny of the of the majority and, and so on. What she's saying is that when you lose a natural hierarchy that actually conflict in the uh, macaque troop or whatever increases. Oh yes. Significantly. And yes. you know, Ken Wilber talked about this with boomeritis where he said, you know, the, the anti-authoritarian bent of the sort of uh, systems and networks post-modernity as a cultural movement in, in trying to criticize and to rid the world of elitist meritocratic mythology has actually opened the space for for people like Trump to to come in, and that that we're we we're, we're left with like riots in the streets yeah. of Chicago and Portland, and like we actually need somebody, you know we you know there's there's this this question of like how do we how do we backpedal back into you know accepting kings? It's like a very yeah. uncomfortable thing. You know, people are starting to look at China and go, God, imagine how. You know, as as horrible as it, what is it that they're doing to themselves and to the the Uyghur, you know, mm -hmm. it's like at the same time, God, wouldn't it be great to have a society with some coherence, some like narrative <laughs> unity that yeah. can like actually take action and like do something, like build public infrastructure for God's sake, you yeah. know? So it's yeah, ugh, it's a mess. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, you know, we're 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 talking about things where. It's, as I say, not moral arguments. We're not talking about like ethics here. We're just talking about power. Like the argument that I made that basically like if a, a dark magician rules the land, you better get your own dark magician to fight that guy. That's not a moral argument. That's just a, you know, that's just a saving your ass kind of argument. And uh, right now, frankly, I'm, 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 for, I'm here for it. I am in favor of um, getting some dark magicians on, I won't say our side, because I'm not going to presume that everybody listening to the show is on the same side, but at least <laughs> it, at least some uh, getting, uh, whatever, I'm getting myself all tied up. Um, we need hackers. You know, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm talking about. But, you know, we just are in this world now. I feel like there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. I don't know any better than anybody else. Like, how do you live in this world? I don't know. I have to, seriously, I don't know. But, uh, but I feel like we are living through a period of time where people are just beginning to feel out the potentialities and capacities of the world situation in which we find ourselves, in which a few invasive species, you know, got there first and kind of controlled everything. It got everything the way they wanted it for themselves. And we, our team, is coming a lot, team, I don't know, team human to, to, to borrow the 
a term from uh, Douglas Rushkoff. Mm. We're coming a- up along behind and we're just like, how do you live in this world? I don't know. But the first thing we probably need is some weapons. <laughs> you know, <laughs> getting back to your macaques, like, it's the first thing you need. It's like you need a hierarchy because you need to have some sense of... Um, of um, strength in a society, right? You have to figure out who's, you know, fuck, I am, I'm beginning to talk nonsense. <laughs> you, you're going to edit this, right? Yeah. Okay. Although I might not edit. Hey, before, this is a great place to pin it, but, you know, because I made the, the mistake of announcing this on Twitter and asking people to contribute questions, I might add this as a, as a Patreon exclusive pin at the end, but I did get a question Cody Thomas Koyak on Twitter, who wanted to ask you as a musicologist, how did Pythagoras and his views on music and harmonies being fundamental to the nature of reality get curtailed by modern academic sciences? Or perhaps what is the current academic role our studies of the quadrivium, as well as the idea of the harmony of the spheres play today? That's a total dogleg from everything we've been talking about, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Oh, man, I am not the right person to talk to. Actually, Meredith, Michael, the show assistant who is doing a really interesting, she's also a doctoral student in my department, is doing a really interesting project that involves this very question. It's not the only um, thing it's about. It's about music and space. But one of the big questions is, why is it that people thought for so long, and in some quarters still do, that music and mathematics or like the harmony of the spheres, the proportions, the mathematical relationships between heavenly bodies. Why did people have the idea that that is what music is, that music is a kind of a mundane or terrestrial manifestation of the same mathematics that governs the heavens? Anyway, that is an idea that I would not say has the greatest of currency right now. But, I mean, it certainly, it had a good run. You know, basically all medieval music theory comes from some version of that idea. I think it exists now maybe as a poetic idea that composers will sometimes play with. But now I'm trying to think, is there a way that that kind of that style of thought continues in some more or less disguised form. There's the data sonification of uh, the orbital periods of exosolar planets. Seems yeah. like it's bringing that back. When they found that they're that they're actually well tempered, that it's like it's not quite a perfect fifth in the the harmonies between one planet and the next because that would create turbulence that would throw off the orbits of the planet. So they've settled into this slightly out of tune fifths that's very interesting i didn't know that yeah i was like well son of a bitch they were right all along you know shit i'm not this is not a very i'm not giving a very good answer and (laughs) the low-hanging fruit is to say that that's an idea that people used to be into and are into no longer uh that that idea is pretty alien to uh certainly any academic understanding of music or 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 space for that matter But I feel like ideas like that never go away. They just sort of continue in some more or less disavowed form. It's the idea that there is a quasi-musical arrangement between things. Well, shit, you know, actually, I play around with that idea sometimes myself. Uh, My idea of diviner's time is basically an idea of a time made musical um, through the resonances, the uncanny repetitions of of omens and the events that they portend or like divinatory portents and then the event that fulfills those portents. Um, The idea that music is a kind of a skeleton key to reality, that there is something in reality that is organized like music. You don't even have to go Pythagorean to think of that. I mean, there's like Schopenhauer's idea of the will and the idea that music is the special art form because music doesn't represent the will. It is the will. It embodies the will. Uh, my friend Mike Gallopy has some very interesting ideas about the a certain kind of incoherence at the heart of that idea. 
But you know, that's uh, you know, leaving aside the specifically Pythagorean version of this, the idea that reality is at bottom somehow musical, that idea kicks around. It's too attractive to let that one go. You know, partly because music itself is so mysterious. You know, why why do we listen? Like, I don't know if you ever do this, but sometimes you listen to music and it's giving you intense pleasure. Do you ever stop and ask, like, why is this so great? Why do I love this abstract arrangement of sounds? Like, if I go for a walk in the woods, I'll hear the sighing of the wind in the trees and the you know, babbling brook or whatever. I'll hear sounds. And I just sort of take that for granted. And maybe if I'm doing some kind of John Cage mindfulness thing, I'll experience it like it's music, right? But what is it But when you take sound elements and you pattern them in a certain way, so you have a periodic beat, that you have harmony, that you have melody, that you have these different sort of dimensions of sound, sound organized in some way, and it, become, and it goes from being just environmental or uh, ambient to being this, oh God, talk about magic, this strange, powerful force that is so invasive. You can be in a perfectly good mood and listen to a sad song, and that, and it's not representing sadness to you. It is changing you. You become sad, like your inner weather changes because of this. The music reaches into you and pushes your buttons. There seems to be some intimate relationship between music and what is going on in us as human beings. It is not much of a leap than to think like, well, maybe music and reality itself, not just me as an individual, but like everything, that there is some intimate relationship between music and the real. Needless to say, as a musician, I like that idea, or at least I feel it intuitively. So maybe mm. it's not so much thinking of it in terms of just narrowly like, oh, the Pythagorean way of framing that intimate relationship between music and the real, but like more generally just wanting to do that. That idea is just going to keep coming up again and again in different forms. And maybe it does because it's true. Yeah. You know, it's the uncanny efficacy of mathematics, right? Yes. That, that whole strain. Yes. Where it's like, right. why does it work? You know, yeah, why exactly. is this, it shouldn't work. And in fact, like I, I just had a conversation with David Wolpert on complexity podcast about his notorious no free lunch theorems, which are like a, a, sort of akin to Gödel's incompleteness theory, where he says that there is an algorithm that that works to explain the world, but you have to make assumptions about the world. And basically you can't have an algorithm that is unconditionally better than any other algorithm because there will always be some world in which it is less effective. And so across all possible worlds, there's no algorithm or across all possible ecosystems, there's no organism that is universally superior. And so therefore it gets us back to this question of like, well, why does the math that we have work yeah. better? Why does yeah. this work? And it's, you're just, it's just a total head scratcher. But then, like you know, your your piece, and we're running what into what was the phrase that you just used? The uncanny efficacy of math, or what was it? Or yeah, the... the uncanny efficacy of mathematics. I forget who said it. He quoted the guy. He mentioned the guy's name in in our conversation. But yeah, it's it's this issue that puts to. We haven't even mentioned the term metamodernism, but I had a great conversation with Zach Stein about this and about how all of science ultimately rests on metaphysics, and again, like rests on aesthetics. And must, because there is, again, to like this question of like, why, why do we like music? There's a, a similar question in why do we prefer parsimonious explanations for the world? Mm. And Simon DeDeo just wrote a really interesting piece about this and about how it gets us into trouble because the, the virtue of preferring a simple co-explanatory narrative for seemingly disparate phenomena is what gets us to love detective stories. But if you follow that pleasure too deeply, then you end up ignoring the actual complexity of the world and you fall mm. into the conspiracy theorist yes. sort of yeah. pareidolia terrain. Right. And so, you know, you have to actually, you have to adhere to, and he, he, he breaks simplicity down into a couple different categories. He's like, you have to 
balance your heuristic for a simple story against other people's different heuristics. And this is a related last piece to Carl Friston, the cognitive neuroscientist who claims that what the brain is actually doing is mitigating surprise. That it's, it's uh, we, he talks about the free energy principle of the brain. The brain is a prediction engine and that it ironically creates additional entropy in the world in order to minimize entropy within itself so as to effectively model the world. And so we're at this point where we're on this, again, we're on this, this sort of nightmare treadmill where the more of an effort we put into predicting things, the more unpredictable the world becomes. And so that's like related, I think, to why you get, to bring it back to music, you get this thing where, and, and Bill Thompson has written about this too, about where every generation thinks the next generation's music is noise, mm. you know, <laughs> because evil in his terms, is the enunciation of the next level of order, which necessarily integrates the sort of John Cage non-musical right. in order to better handle its relationship to to pattern and to ruptures of that pattern. Mm. So I don't know. There's something, again, like in everything you're saying about oh, so much science has gone into music and surprise and how what we find a huge piece of what we find pleasurable about music is that balance between the expected and the unexpected. Right. You know, right. so I right. don't know. I don't know if that gets to Cody's question, but there should yeah. be, there should be a, I don't know, the unreasonable efficacy of music. That would be, <laughs> you know, that's, that's a thing too. Uh, the unreasonable efficacy of math and the unreasonable efficacy of music. Maybe those things have, something to do with one another or maybe those are just two unreasonably efficacious things and by their very unreasonable efficacity we're like well then they must have something to do with one another i don't know i can't claim any particular privilege insight into the ultimate nature of reality but i would like to think that music has something to do with it well if you could then you would automatically be setting yourself up right for for a, a, a trap, the world remains in to reference pro wrestling, completely unpinnable. <laughs> you know? I should point out, by the way, that uh, while I am a big fan of uh, televised combat sports, as you pointed out, I am not a fan of professional wrestling. <laughs> it's weird. I, I mean, like, it's funny. Uh, I guess I am rather old fashioned in this respect. I like my sporting contests to be unscripted. I like there to be doubt about the outcome. I would like the outcome to be as a result of legitimate sporting competition. And of course, none of that shit is exactly what's going on in professional wrestling. And so professional wrestling is not interesting to me as a combat sports spectacle, but it is so interesting to me as a spectacle of basically the way pro wrestling works, the reality claims of pro wrestling works, that that is how our world works. And I find it very interesting from that point of view. I don't know why I suddenly started talking about combat sports. Maybe I just wanted to make sure before I went off and cooked dinner for my family that I had to make sure that nobody who listens to your show thinks that I'm a big fan of professional wrestling. Well, I like, uh, I like departing from the recipe when I'm cooking. You know, yes, like jazz. I love classical music, but like this, the, again, it's that we're always disappointed when we find out someone's been lip syncing, you know? know, and that's like so much harder to to fraud when, you know, these people are coming together for the first time in a, an improvisational ensemble. Or my but, version of this, if I have, if I'm cooking a recipe from a cookbook and we have company over before they get there, I'll put the cookbook away because I don't want people to think I'm just cooking from a cookbook. I want people to think that I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head, I, giving all my secrets away on your show. <laughs> well, we'll keep a few up the sleeve for next time. Okay, Dude, so, very good. This was a total pleasure. Yeah, it's a blast. Thank you Fun so much. You. Good luck with your your spectacle, putting on <laughs> your, your cooking spectacle for your family there. All right. Anything else before we go? Any obviously weird studies? Yeah, listen to our show. It's awesome. Yeah. 
Awesome. There, I, I, that's 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 all I can that's all I can think to say about that. It's just been a real pleasure talking to you. As always, I always enjoy talking to you, Michael. Indeed. Thanks so much for being on the show. All right. Thanks again for listening. Future Fossils is an independent, entirely listener-supported program. If you believe in the work that I'm doing and you want to help see it thrive into the unimaginable future, then you can avail yourself of all of the backstage goodies at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Or you can just leave a review at Apple Podcasts. That's more helpful than you know. Reach out to me personally at Michael Garfield on Twitter or Instagram and have a wonderful eon.